be seated. I'm going to have to keep my cap on because it's just a little too sunny. And um, it's this or sunglasses, and sunglasses would just be creepy. So um, I'm going to have to keep my cap on. I hope uh, that's understandable for you. We are today in Second Peter chapter 3. Allow me to read verses 1 through 10. Uh, but verses 3 through 7 will be our focus today. So let's hear God's word again together. This is now, beloved, the second epistle I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere minds by way of reminder that you should remember the words that were spoken previously by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior spoken through us, the apostles. Know this first, that there shall come scoffers in the last days who walk after their own lusts and say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were since the beginning of creation. For they willingly ignore that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed was flooded with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But beloved, do not be ignorant of this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient with us because he does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth also and the works that are in it will be burned up. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Peter is writing to stir us up, reminding us of the Lord's return. And Peter here comes to his prime motivation in stirring up the saints of his day. And that is to warn them of scoffers that will come. Those who try to seem smart by mocking the gospel and consequently the need for the gospel, which is sin. Remember, in the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death. And in doing that, we are proclaiming the reason for his death. And in the same way, in marking the Lord's return, which is the final promise of the good news, in mocking that, the entire gospel is mocked. So brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today to pay attention to the morality and the theology of scoffers in your generation so that you might believe the promise of the gospel in God's word, that you might believe it, not bash it. Again, we're considering scoffers in our generation. For each generation has its own rendition of the scoffing that Peter is talking about 
in this passage. And so first we see the arrival of scoffers. For those of you who like to plan ahead and, and those of you who are, are uh, like to try to track my train of thought, which I would love to think is all of you, but I'm not going to get my hopes up. We have five points today to draw out this passage, and they all start with A, the arrival of scoffers, the aim of scoffers, the argument of scoffers, the ambivalence of scoffers, and fifthly, the arrival of scoffers. I know. Two of those are the same point, but they aren't. So we'll see that when we get there. The arrival of scoffers. Know this first, that there shall, be, that there shall come scoffers in the last days. The last days, the days after Jesus Christ has come in his first advent before he comes again. At the end of the eschaton, in that eschatological day, when he draws all things to their appointed end. Hebrews begins, God, who at various times and in diverse ways has spoken long ago to the fathers through the, through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the world. In 1 Corinthians 10, that we're reminded, we are reminded that all of these things that have happened in all the ages are written for us. They are tracked as examples for us upon whom the end of the ages has come. And yet, though in this age, this end of days, there are many generations and so that is why we pay attention to the scoffers in our own generation. Listen, those of you who like to study theology, know that the theologians you are studying are all responding to particular concerns of their day. And if you do not translate that into our day and what we are facing in our day, you are not doing theology you are holding an ongoing memorial service. We have scoffers in our day that those men, as great and brilliant as they were, did not face. And so we must take the grand truths that they expounded from Scripture and we must apply them to our generation and the scoffers that we find around us. As the scoffers arrive, we see that they simply mock the gospel. Uh, there's a textual interplay here that I think has some nuance, but I don't want to make too much of it, but this word here for scoffing is uh, ties in with kind of a childish element. And I think of just the, the mocking and taunting, the bullying, if you will, that children can practice. Adults can practice it too, but, but it's easier to point out the children doing it. This bullying and this taunting that goes on as people mock the gospel. David tells us in Psalm 1 that we are blessed when we do not sit in the seat of scoffers. In Psalm 119, he relates how he has been derided, how he has been taunted by these men, and yet he is driven to greater faithfulness to God's law. Scoffers have arrived. What is their aim? What is the aim of scoffers? Peter tells us that it is to walk after their own lusts. We understand this backwards too many times. 
We think that people think through things theologically and then arrive at what the behavior they are allowed to have if their theology is true. But more often than not, sinful desire is the starting place. That is where it begins. And then the sinful heart crafts a theology that fits with accomplishing that desire. Young people, pay attention. Listen to me. So often in my years of ministry, a young man, a young woman will come and they will present with problems of, I'm not sure the gospel is really true. I'm not sure Jesus really is who he said he is. And I'm talking about young men and women who have grown up in the church like so many of you have. I'm not sure the gospel is really true. And early on in my ministry, I started trying to address that issue. But over the years, I learned to ask one question. What is the sin that they have allowed to start dominating their life? Because what happens is sin creeps in and then it takes over and then your heart reminds you, you know, if we're going to keep doing this unabated, unconvicted, we've got to come up with a different worldview, a different belief system, a different gospel. Because the one that we have said we believe will not peacefully coexist with this sin. So we need to start editing. And the heart begins to edit. Young people, keep sin at bay. You cannot find peace and comfort in pornography or sexual activity or perversion of any kind. You cannot find hope in addiction and in drunkenness and still hold on to the gospel as you know it now. The gospel will start to change. Your theology will start to change to meet with the growing desire and longing and lust of your heart. These scoffers walk after their own lusts. Every week we sing from Psalm 119 about walking in the way of the Lord, loving the law of the Lord, desiring the word of the Lord, loving the word of the Lord. These are all the phrases that we sing time and time and time again. And the scoffer sings the same songs, but to the lusts of their heart. That is what they love. That is what they long for. That is what they desire. That is what they walk after. That is what they try to find their hope in. That becomes their singular aim and focus of their existence and being. It's morality, then theology in the way of the world. For the Christian, though, the word defines our way. For indeed, the word, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. And mark my words, young people, that sin creeps in, it takes over, it takes command of your life, and you'll soon be looking for all sorts of ways that you can find peace with God apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is unattainable. It is impossible. So what do we find then? by way of the argument of scoffers. Number three, the argument of scoffers. They walk after their own lusts and they say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things 
have continued as they were since the beginning of creation. Now listen, this shows some familiarity with God's word. Because I read Genesis 5.5, so all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. In Genesis 5.8, so all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. In Genesis 5.11, so all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. In Genesis 5.14, so all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. In Genesis 5.17, so all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. And all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And all the days of Methuselah were 900. 169 years and he died so all the days of Lamech were 777 years the perfect age and he died all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died look I'm noticing a trend here everyone is dying and someday we will die so who cares what does it matter? God made a promise, but he's obviously not going to keep that promise. So who cares if we do what we want? God hasn't come down in judgment. He hasn't come down and, and struck us dead for what we are doing. So he either doesn't care or he actually thinks it's pretty cool. They realize, as the psalm says, that they don't know change. They don't see change. So therefore, they do not fear God. They think it's all a joke. And their argument is, look, he made promises. He promised that somebody would come. Jesus came. He promised that, that someone would die. He died. He promised that, that someone would raise again. He rose again. At least that's what they tell us. And, but now he's supposed to come back, and he hasn't come back. So why don't we just do what we want to do? That's their argument. As we will see in the coming weeks, totally missing the point. Totally missing the patience of God, the great love of God that gives time for the gospel to work, it gives time for the gospel to change them. And so, see, then we see the ambivalence, we start to see this cacophony of ideas. Number four, the ambivalence of the scoffers, for they willingly ignore. That by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed, standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed was flooded with water and perished. Now, you can only ignore something that you know. So they know this. They've read it, they've heard it, it's probably been taught to them. This tells us that the scoffers that Peter is warning us about, there's plenty of scoffers out there, but there may be scoffers rise up in here, which we need to be doubly careful as they so easily lead others astray. But they start to form these contradictory ideas, and the cognitive dissonance does not allow for any competing idea to stand but the whole system is built on untrue facts. And think about our own world. God created the heavens and the earth by the word of his power. It's completely a fairy tale to our world. They willfully ignore the grand beauty and design, the great power that can be seen in the nature around them. They ignore it. They downplay it. They will not accept it as anything valid. As, I, as I've said to you before, I've, I've done quite a bit of traveling in my life, and you end up at various uh, 
displays and various parks and things like this and love to see the nature displays explaining how this part of the world came to be about, how it was shaped and formed. And one thing I've seen time and time and time and time again is that this place could not exist as it does without at some point there being great, great amounts of water here. And then you have to come up with the whole flow, no pun intended, of how all these great amounts of water were at various spots on the earth at different times because we can't just admit that maybe there were great amounts of water covering the whole earth at the same time. It's a fairy tale. It's a joke. They forget that the word of God Well, they don't forget, they ignore that the word of God that created the world, sustained the world, used that created order to destroy the entire world except for eight people. And now that same word is holding the creation together, reserving it for judgment, not of all, but of just the ungodly. This scoffing begins by denying the fundamental nature of creation. Hebrews 11.3, By faith we understand that the universe was framed by the word of God so that things that are seen were not made out of things which are invisible, which are visible. So invisible things created the visible things, is what's that saying. God created the universe. Plain and simple. But listen, Hebrews 11 reminds us that this is seen by faith. It's not seen by Christians getting mad at them. It's not seen by Christians mocking them, calling them idiots, calling them dummies. It's not seen by that. It's seen by faith. This is not a scientific evidentiary issue. This is a faith issue. This is a gospel issue. Genesis 1, 6 and 9, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. This is what Peter is giving comment to, that that passage of God's creation of the land. Psalm 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their host by the breath of his mouth. And then Psalm 148, verses 4 and 5, Praise him, you highest of heavens, and you waters that are above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. Why? For he commanded, and they were created. It's the word of God. The ambivalence of the scoffers of our day is not really about human physicality, and sexuality. It isn't really about humanity as much as it is about the deity who would have the right to call the shots if we allow him any room in defining truth and reality. There's one individual that I follow on Instagram Uh, strictly to see how folks like him see the world. Identifies as a non-binary person. The other day on one of his Instagram reels, he said uh, he was responding to someone who uh, was claiming to be a Christian and kind of coming against him on something. And he said, I grew up a Christian. He's says he's a Buddhist now. I grew up a Christian. I grew up a good Lutheran. I was in church every Sunday. And I remember one Sunday hearing that God created people in his image. And I thought, that means God is just like me. Friends, it's not rebellion against us. It's not rebellion even against science. 
It's not rebellion against sexuality. It's rebellion against the creator. That should change our posture and how we approach them with the gospel. With truth. They are full of this cacophony of competing ideas. The whole binary language issue that's before us. This is the language given to us in scripture. God created man. It's not a sexist phrase. That's a reality. Man is in all of humanity. God created man male and female. Male and female, he created them. This gives us the fundamental understanding for who we are as people. And it's unavoidable. Every description of any supposed alternate existence outside of the binary can only be talked about in binary terms. I'm a man, but I act like a woman. I'm a woman, I act like a man. I'm neither man nor woman. That's all there is, is male and female. It is the great presupposition of humanity. But the competing ideas, and something's got to go. Young people, again, this is the danger of letting that sin creep in. Something's got to go. It's either going to be the sin, or it's going to be the truth of God's word. It goes beyond then just the fundamental nature of creation. But denying the fundamental nature of the world to the created order's testimony to the events of Scripture. Being unable to look around them. Acting like nothing has happened. Acting like a trickling stream through the desert is what created the Grand Canyon. When just a, a few hundred miles away sits the meteorite crater that was created in a moment when a meteor hit the earth. And it's a fraction of the size of the Grand Canyon. The ambivalence of scoffers is probably the most frustrating thing for us as believers but let it not drive us to hate or annoyance or mocking of them. Let it drive us to love for the truth and love of them in the truth. Fifthly, this last point, Pastor Joel must have been out of steam. He just picked one of his other points and chose to repeat it. The arrival of the scoffers. But this isn't the arrival of scoffers in our generation. This is the arrival of scoffers before the judgment seat. Prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah reminds God's people, Now therefore, do not continue as mockers, lest your bonds be made stronger. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts, of determined destruction upon the whole earth. This should drive us to evangelism and this should drive us to keep sin far from us that we would not be tempted to alter our theology and have the bonds of sin grow stronger in our hearts. Because the final destination of the scoffer is the burning torment of hell by way of the judgment seat of Christ. 
when they stand there and see face to face, they will look eye to eye with the one whom they have mocked, whom they have taunted, whom they have persecuted, whom they have hated, whom they have scorned. Remember the words of Christ on the road to Damascus to Paul? He didn't say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute the church? Why do you harass believers? Why do you torment Christians? No, he said, why do you persecute me? Done against the church. It's done against Christ. And they will stand one day and they will see him face to face. And all of the truth will flood back into their minds. All the things they avoided, all the things they denied, all the things they hated, all the things that they mocked, they will know fully and finally to be true. But they will also know this heartbreaking reality that at that point, it will be too late. The same word from the same God that created the world, raising up the land out of the water, that used that water to destroy that ancient world because of sin, is maintaining the heavens and the earth as we know it, preserving it, keeping it for judgment. And on that day will come great destruction. Not annihilation. This isn't saying that the wicked will be no more, but the schemes and the kingdoms and the logic of the wicked will be destroyed. Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And in a few more verses, Peter will remind us that we are waiting for that new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. So friends, guard your hearts. Don't be led astray by sinful lusts that cause you to change, to tweak, to jettison your theology to fit your morality. Don't forget, and worse, don't remember and mock the promises of God. And and, and what is that promise? Peter here is pointing to that final rendition of that promise in the return of Christ. But that return of Christ is only made... uh, is only the fullness of the leaving of Christ and the ascension. And that ascension only took place because he raised from the dead because he was buried and he was killed and he was incarnated. And we are pointed back to that day when God stood between his people and the enemy and he tucked them behind him and he said, the seed of the woman will come and will crush your head. all the great promises of God that we were nothing and we've been made something, that we were not a people and now we are a people. We weren't a kingdom and now we are a kingdom. That promise that a heart of stone will be removed and a heart of flesh that loves and beats for God will be put in our chest. The promise that our blind eyes will be made to see, that our deaf ears will be made to hear. Even that promise that the dead will live again as we see just the the tip of the iceberg in Lazarus and then in Christ. All of these great promises are found in their fullness and embodied in Jesus Christ who is the fulfillment of all those promises of God for us. For in Him, it all happens 
for us. Don't mock the promise of God. Believe the promise of God and be saved. Believe the promise of the gospel in God's word. Don't bash it. Let's stand and pray. Father, I pray for each heart here today. I ask, Lord, that your spirit would penetrate each one with the truth of the gospel. Lord, that if there are any here today that have been tempted towards scoffing, that they would turn and repent, see the danger of their ways. If they've been tempted to leave behind any truth of God's word, that they would pick it up again. That they would reorient themselves around the glorious grace that is found in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that if there is any heart here that has not been converted, that your Holy Spirit would convert them today. And Lord, that they would know peace with God. They would know what it is to have hell canceled and heaven guaranteed. And Lord, that they would walk with you all of their days. Lord, I pray for each one that we would stand in the face of scoffers, not in our own power, not in our own sense of superiority, but Lord, we would stand by the strength of Jesus Christ and by the truth of his gospel. And Lord, that we would be bold in proclaiming, we would be wise in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. For in it alone will they be saved and by faith be able to see the truth of all that you have done in this world and in the gospel. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And church, let us pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.